So hello everybody, welcome to Oxy Arts and to the exhibition Encoding Futures, Critical Imaginaries of AI. We're so happy to have you all here for our final, final curatorial walkthrough. Uh, I'm Mashna Gafirin Tekopian. I am the co-curator of this exhibition with Meldia Yasayan, uh, the director of Oxy Arts. And I am a uh, Mellon professor of the practice here at Occidental this semester, where I'm teaching an accompanying course on art, AI, and algorithmic justice. Uh, very happy to have you all here. And I want to start off with the kind of conceptual framework for the exhibition. Uh, so when we were putting this show together, we were thinking about the prospect of visualizing the ways in which algorithmic systems uh, act as a force upon the socio-technical terrain of our world. So in essence, we were wondering about how to create visual correlatives for the ways that algorithms impact us, ways that are often unseen and very, very difficult to bring to material form or to visual form. Uh, and we were thinking specifically about the work of people like Ruha Benjamin, who writes in Race After Technology, that storytelling and creative methods uh, can help us to write alternative narratives of techno futures. Um, we were thinking about the work of uh, Catherine Dignazio and Lauren Klein and Data Feminism, who write that artists and cultural workers can actually make very crucial contributions to data science through methods of experimentation and observation. And finally, uh, thinking a lot about queer of color critique and the writing of folks like Jose Munoz, uh, who argues that the aesthetic or the field of artistic practice is a place where we can glimpse uh, blueprints for alternative futurities. So those were the kinds of co constellations of ideas that were swirling around this show. And we were thinking, uh, lastly and more specifically, about how to unpack the black box. The black box is a term in conversations around algorithms and AI systems for the space of opaque decision making that's hidden from view. Uh, so for example, when an individual uh, applies for a certain credit limit and an algorithm makes a determination about whether or not they will get that limit, the criteria for making that determination, the rubric that it used to make its decisions, those, those kinds of judgments are not available to the public. So algorithms and the space of algorithmic decision making is one that profoundly impacts all of us in ways that we are uh, not allowed to know, in ways that are intentionally occluded from our view. The artists that we're thinking about are unpacking uh, the black box and, and thinking about glass box approaches uh, that are transparent, accountable, and allow us to sense or to know or to feel the ways that al algorithms impact us. So looking over here, one of the first things that you see when you enter into the space is uh, this grid of alternative models of AI. So we wanted to offer an exhibition that was not only sort of diagnosing the uh, troubling factors in our present algorithmic, algorithmic terrain, but also offering productive alternatives. So this group of affinities, uh, the, this set, set of affinity groups, including Black in AI, Latinx in AI, Queer in AI, and the Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence Working Group, are all united by the attempt to think of alternative ways of producing AI systems. Uh, alternative in a number of ways. First of all, they're questioning who is in the room when algorithms and AI systems are coded, researched, and developed, whose concerns are guiding that process, and how can we alter the composition and demographics of those rooms uh, toward less homogeneous and more heterogeneous uh, compositions. And they're also thinking, for in the case, uh, for example, of the Indigenous Protocol and AI Working Group, about alternative epistemologies of AI, meaning alternative ways of knowing and thinking about AI that are coming from frameworks that aren't foregrounding um, the Western, Western perspective or uh, inheriting uh, Western philosophical ideals. So moving over here, we have a work by the artist and researcher Caroline Sinders called Feminist Dataset. The guiding question of this work is, is it possible to train a feminist AI? And is it possible to extend the authorship of an AI system uh, to a collaborative process of co-authorship? So the ways in which Caroline Sanders approaches these questions are uh, heavily collaborative and they involve uh, workshops as one of the primary features of her methodology. So she'll convene a workshop in a particular community, bless you, 
and she will um, ask the members of that workshop to submit specific data points. Um, I.e., she'll ask them, if you were training a feminist AI, what would you want it to know? What, what is a song that you would want a feminist AI to be able to sing? What is a poem you would want a feminist AI to be able to recite? What is an artwork you would want it to be able to analyze? And once the members of the workshop submit their feminist data points, uh, it goes through a kind of question and answer process where she asks, is this data point intersectional? Does it foreground queer, indigenous, and trans perspectives? Uh, does it critique practices and frameworks within a feminist rhetoric? And so all of these questions are approached as a group in this collaborative setting. And if the answer to all of the questions is yes, then it is eventually submitted to the feminist data set. And uh, the data set will eventually be deployed toward co coding a voice interactive AI agent. And she's given the people, uh, the visitors of this show, the opportunity to participate in submitting uh, feminist data points through this set of worksheets. So visitors are encouraged to fill out one of these worksheets, uh, answering the questions, for example, um, make your own feminist work here. It can be a call to arms, a poem, or a manifesto. And then place that in the filing cabinet, uh, where it will eventually be used to code a voice interactive AI. Moving over here, we have a work by Maya Ganesh called A is for Another. And uh, this work offers a kind of alternative dictionary of AI. Um, so typically when I ask people on this tour, uh, what is the first thing you think of when you think of an AI system, um, they will often respond with an, a robot from a popular Hollywood film or a very popular example like Tay, the racist Twitter bot produced by Microsoft, who was supposed to be for entertainment purposes, but within about 16 hours developed um, genocidal and white supremacist tendencies after interacting with people on the internet and had to be very swiftly retired. Um, so these are, the, these are the kinds of associations uh, that exist with AI in the popular imaginary. Associations that either uh, are linked to Silicon Valley or to Hollywood. And what Maya Ganesh is doing in this kind of spiraling web is trying to produce alternative associations beyond those culturally homogenous sites. Uh, so when you load this uh, relational, relational map, you see this uh, kaleidoscopic network of flickering orbs that are constantly in motion in relationship to one another. And you're able to uh, activate various different orbs and then follow them out to external URLs that multiply the meanings of AI. And their flickering, uh, constantly mobile nature is kind of visually correlative to the porousness um, and mutability of AI's meanings. Here we have one of our uh, only works that's thinking about f uh, future ecologies and ways of knowing beyond the human, but specifically from the biological perspective. So the majority of the works in the show are thinking about um, machinic non-human ways of knowing, and this is thinking about the way that plants and biological non-human life can know and can produce different knowledge systems. It's by the artist Arusiak Gabrielian, who is a professor at USC and um, produces incredible work on post-human habitats and post-human ecologies. Uh, so she's imagining here essentially a, a mode or a speculative model for how we can seed new knowledge systems. Um, this is a very, very heavily detail intensive work, so I, I encourage everybody to come by afterward and take a closer look. But what she's done is taken uh, works of philosophy that inherit the logic of the Western Enlightenment and um, planted seeds every time a specific word occurs or a specific idea occurs and essentially tried to undo or unsettle or deossify these ideas and seed them with new forms of knowing. And then finally, we have uh, the work over here by Nayama Safia Sandy, The Bend. So this work was initially installed at over 80 locations in New York City as a public art campaign. And the locations were specifically chosen to correspond to places where there's a disproportionate concentration of CCTV cameras and surveillance systems, um, I, which of course correlate to uh, communities of color and low income communities, which are disproportionately impacted by um, the surveillance apparatus. 
So the artist uh, Nayama describes having this vision of the future sort of come to her in the form of the bend, which is the visual form that's repeated across these three works. And the bend to her uh, signified a kind of portal that you could cross through and enter a future beyond the datification and quantification of black life. And the slogans that are superimposed over that visual form likewise imagine this, this kind of futurity beyond uh, the current algorithmic limits of our, of our present world. So in this nook over here, we have two primary uh, works that are primarily sound-based. Uh, on the left side, we have Voicing Erasure by Algorithmic Justice League. Uh, Algor how many of you are familiar with Algorithmic Justice League? OK. So Algorithmic Justice League is an arts research and advocacy organization that was founded by Joy Bolamwini who was a researcher at MIT, who was one of the first people to discover that facial recognition systems routinely uh, misclassify and misidentify uh, black and darker skinned faces. And uh, Bolamwini discovered this when she realized that the facial recognition system that she was interacting with wouldn't recognize her face until she put on a white mask. Uh, she went on to found Algorithmic Justice League, and in this audio work, they're responding to a new set of research um, showing extreme racial disparities in audio recognition. So uh, automated speech recognition is the technology that powers Alexa, Siri, Cortana, any of the digital uh, voice assistants that you use, uh, that many use on a daily basis. So this recent study had shown that uh, automated speech systems vastly disproportionately fail to recognize speech um, by black speakers. And the reason for that was that white speakers were uh, remarkably overrepresented in the training data, meaning uh, speech by white speakers had been used to train these systems, um, resulting in what Algorithmic Justice League refers to as the erasure of other voices. So in this sound piece by Bolamwini, she's produced a, a poem that's then read by a set of media studies scholars and technologists who are calling for a future in which everyone is heard, essentially. And in this work by Mandy Harris-Williams, which you all heard coming into the gallery space from outside, um, Mandy Harris-Williams uh, initiates a kind of new iteration of her Brown Up Your Feed project. And her Brown Up Your Feed project reflects on desirability privilege um, on di digital platforms. So thinking about the ways in which digital platforms prioritize and deprioritize content by lighter or darker skinned people um, through using coordinates of ageism, sizeism, bodyism, colorism, and so forth. Uh, so in this, in this sound work, she produces a kind of inventory of all the algorithms that have been determinative to her life and lived experience, from whiteness, uh, which she thinks about as an algorithm, to femininity, to blackness, and so forth. Um, and I, of course, it's very difficult to capture the texture of, of these sound pieces without any visual cues, so I strongly recommend um, listening to them. They're both incredibly, um, they're both incredibly haunting. So this installation here is by the artist Lauren Lee McCarthy, and it's called Lauren. Uh, Lauren is a, Lauren the artist, not Lauren the installation, is a professor at UCLA in design media arts. And in this work, she's attending to what it means to let a system like Alexa into your home. So for this project, she advertised herself as a human intelligent smart home and gave people the opportunity to have her installed in their home for a week. And if you chose to participate in this project, she would uh, send you this suite of custom networked devices, and she would essentially monitor you for seven days and, remo and control your home remotely. So you could interact with her in the same way that you would in Alexa. You could say, uh, Lauren, please order more toothpaste, or Lauren, uh, please put in a delivery order, um, I'd like some ramen, or Lauren, remind me that I need to make a doctor's appointment for next week, so on and so forth. And this, she found that people who participated in this project felt uncomfortable in a number of ways. They reported the strangeness of speaking in a command-based, directive-oriented way to a human agent. They essentially reported discomfort having the kinds of encounters with her that they were having on a daily basis with Alexa. And this surfaced two things. One, the fact that we are being trained through the use of these technologies to normalize and habitualize the process of having these 
very aggressive command-oriented encounters with feminine coded agents because uh, as a UN study from 2019 showed, uh, the vast overwhelming majority of digital voice assistants are feminine coded. We're fine with that, but when it becomes a human agent at the other end of the line, the kind of discomfort and gendered nature of that really comes to the surface first. And second, the fact that we allow devices like Alexa into our most intimate domestic space. Uh, we are unaware of the ways in which Alexa is coded or the Amazon Echo is coded. We're unaware of when and how it's collecting our data, what it's doing with our data after the fact. Essentially, we are unaware of the kinds of privacies we are surrendering when we uh, invite this into our home. But the uncanniness and the discomfort of that gets sort of glossed over um, by the patina of the, the kind of technological apparatus around her. When you see a human, a human face watching you um, and you know that it is able to access the most intimate details of your life, that discomfort becomes a bit more pronounced and starts to come to the surface. And you begin asking questions about who has access to your data, how and why. Uh, this is a work by the artist Kite who is a, um, a Lakota artist and researcher who has produced an incredibly robust body of scholarship around what it would mean to create indigenous AI. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that she thinks about is, for example, the prospect of producing an AI system that's guided by the Lakota idea of making work that is good for seven generations into the future. Um, so this kind of expanded time scale that is starkly contrasted with the time scale of the tech sector, which as we know is move fast and break things. Rather than moving fast and breaking things, Lakota epistemologies ask us to think, um, what is our movement now going to do for seven generations into the future? So in this work, uh, Kite is looking at the history and present of Kruger Island, which is an island in New York off the Hudson that was bought in the 19th century by a wealthy man named John Kruger. Um, for reasons which are uh, absolutely unclear, Kruger then decided to purchase Mayan ruins in Honduras, create casts of them, and uh, transport these indigenous Mayan ruins to Kruger Island, which was also the site of its own indigenous communities, and create this kind of um, uh, faux makeshift ersatz indigenous ruins site. By the 1950s, this site became very popular for excavations and, and archaeological work. And so essentially, it became a place that was mined for knowledge and data. And indigenous cultural artifacts and indigenous human remains were exhumed and transported to the New York State Museum as objects of knowledge. So what Kite is doing in this work is arguing that the way that we approach AI systems, uh, the way that we try to translate people and communities into objects of knowledge and into data through AI uh, is, is rooted in the legacies of colonial logic and colonial violence that have tried to transform communities into objects that can be known and then uh, controlled and managed as populations. Um, it's got a LiDAR motion detector, so the video changes um, when it detects, the video typically changes when it detects somebody uh, standing in front of it. So the idea is that uh, the closer you try to approach or the more intimate the set of knowledge you try to um, extract from the imagery, the more it eludes your, your attempt to do that. And let's go over here to Astria Suprax, Sympathetic White Robots and Cyborgs. So this is uh, an installation with two discrete works. The collage that we're seeing uh, on the wall here is called Sympathetic White Robots and Cyborgs. Um, this is, they're both part of uh, Astria Suprax Media Archaeology Project where she has sifted through about 50 years of US sci-fi cinema to surface instances where um, Asian cultures have been extracted and used as raw matter, raw data, uh, ornamental material, window dressing, et cetera, um, to imagine futures that are absent any actual Asian protagonists. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second, but in this collage, what we're seeing is a set of uh, examples of robots that are painted as sympathetic 
or um, sweet or worthy of your emotional connection. Robots that are asking you to cathect to them. Um, you will notice that, of course, they are all white. And one of the arguments that Astria is making here is that even with non-human agents and robotic agents, you can, uh, Hollywood makes an argument for empathizing with these agents and for humanizing them on the basis of their proximity to whiteness. Um, and my favorite uh, is Sniffles. So, <laughs> so here we have Virtually Asian, which is a video collage uh, where she has instant, uh, surfaced some of the more exemplary instances of the treatment of Asian cultures as a monolith, the treatment of Asian cultures as a site for uh, mining visual motifs. Um, and of course, she, she traces the ways in which uh, this is done across a series of films that are as recent as Blade Runner 2049. Um, so we see this in Ghost in the Shell, in the casting of Scarlett Johansson in a role that should have gone to an East Asian actress. Um, we also see this in films like Minority Report, where the entire background of the urban cityscape is holograms of uh, geishas and um, East Asian women who are used in a kind of um, advertising or promotional role but are nowhere to be found as primary protagonists who represent their own narratives or act as uh, transformative agents in the narrative of the film. And finally, we will end here with Stephanie Dinkins' work. Uh, on the left, we have what is a kind of canonical work of this emerging field um, of art and AI. It's Conversations with Bina48. So what we're seeing is the artist Stephanie Dinkins uh, engaging in a series of dialogues with this social robot, uh, Bina48. Bina48 was developed by uh, Hanson Robotics, who developed Sophia the Robot, if any of you are familiar with her, and uh, Terrasem Foundation, which is a transhumanist uh, foundation that tries to imagine what life will look like beyond the human. She's modeled on a real woman, Bina Rothblatt, and she came about because Bina Rothblatt's wife, Martine Rothblatt, who incidentally is the founder of Sirius XM, uh, wanted to immortalize her wife's consciousness. And so in a sense, Bina 48 is a kind of love letter to Bina Rothblatt. And Bina Rothblatt sat for roughly 100 hours of interviews uh, to develop the data set that was used to train this bot. And it was through those interviews uh, that, that Bina 48's consciousness came about. So she is, she is widely considered to be one of the smartest uh, social robots in existence. She was the first robot to successfully pass a college course um, in philosophy. And she can have conversations about Descartes and Heidegger and the Enlightenment. Um, so you might imagine that Stephanie Dinkins was pretty taken aback to find that though Bina 48 can talk about Descartes and Heidegger, uh, she cannot or could not at the time display consciousness of her own race or racial identity. So though she was modeled on a black woman and could have these incredibly complex and far-ranging conversations, her coding and her data had omitted any refer or any meaningful understanding of what it means to be a racially minoritized body. Uh, Stephanie Dinkins, of course, was really fascinated by what this means in thinking about futures of the human and in thinking about how we code futures more broadly and underwent this series of conversations with Bina 48 that are captured in video. Uh, and as she had these conversations with Bina 48, she also had conversations with her developers and slowly discovered that her ability to talk about race became more and more complex over time. But in, another interesting thing happened that translated into this work. Uh, Stephanie Dinkins eventually was able to meet Bina Rothblatt, the woman uh, who serves as the model for Bina 48. And Bina Rothblatt essentially told her that she was pretty happy with the way that Bina 48 represents her, uh, i.e. that Bina 48 was more or less accu accurately reflective of her own sense of her racial identity and her experience of race. And Stephanie Dinkins describes that, at that after that conversation, it became clear to her that she had perhaps been imagining that Bina would reflect a kind of experience of race that was closer to her own and, and perhaps monolithicizing um, what that would mean. And she realized that she couldn't ask one 
one robot to do that work. And so she decided to train her own AI system. And she trained an AI system called uh, Not the Only One. And this was a system, a voice interactive bot that she trained using data from three generations of women in her family. And she calls this a multi-generational memoir of a black American family. And when you speak to Not the Only One, or N2 for short, uh, she is able to answer the questions, who are your people? Do you know racism? Uh, and she is able to offer a sense of her own cultural identity, a cultural identity that is uh, closely aligned with Stephanie Dinkins. And Dinkins thinks of this project as a kind of um, exercise in community data and community sovereignty, uh, an exercise in thinking about small data and how you can use uh, data to develop co-authorship for people who have historically been underrepresented in the authorship of AI systems. So what we're looking at here is a visual composite of the generations of women who were used to train and to, so the kind of visual avatar of this voice interactive AI. Uh, and Stephanie Dinkins is someone who has been crucially uh, sort of foundational to this field of work, uh, the intersection of art, AI, and justice. Um, and she's someone who has made a very strong case for the fact that for people who have been uh, traditionally excluded or omitted from data-driven or algorithmically enabled considerations of the future, it's all the more crucial uh, for them to be able to assume authorship of these systems and the futures to come. So I will end there and thank you all again so much for being here.